Welcome, good morning everyone to STR Intel podcast number 28. Today we have a very special and wonderful guest with us by the name of Dr. Rosemary Rossetti, author of Universal Design Toolkit and an expert in accessible and universal design. She speaks to and consults with design and building professionals and people who want to create homes that are more accessible, safe, and convenient. She and her husband are designers, builders, and occupants of the Universal Design Living Laboratory, the National Demonstration Home and Garden in Columbus, Ohio, that is the highest rated universal design home in North America. Dr. Rosetti, welcome. Thank you for joining us here on Short Term Rental Intel. Well, thank you, Killing. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Just to get started, of course, one of the, the first questions is, could you please explain to us what is universal design? Well, universal design is a, a, a fundamental concept. Think of it as a philosophy. The term universal design came on the scene in the mid-1980s. Um, this term is about the design of environments, the design of products, and the design of communication so that it's usable by all people without specialized design. So taking a look at any environment in terms of the vacation rental homes, to what extent can this home be usable by all people, and can the design be such that it doesn't look institutional or special, that these design features were built into it. So it's all inclusive so that all guests can stay here equally. Wonderful. How did you personally get interested in the topic of universal design? Well, I'm speaking to you today from my wheelchair, from my home office in Columbus, Ohio, which is the Universal Design Living Laboratory. And I'm in this wheelchair because of an accident. I was struck by a 7,000 pound tree on June 13th of 1998 while riding my bicycle and suddenly paralyzed from the waist down. So Killian, really by accident, the universal design component came into my vision when I started reading about people who used wheelchairs and came home from the hospital. How were they going to make that home work for them? And the first time I learned about it was in a magazine, looking at a kitchen and a woman in a wheelchair in her kitchen. And I said to my husband, look, this kitchen has been designed for this woman in a wheelchair and I was so frustrated in our current home. So I started reading about universal design and learning about it from the aspect of the frustration of being home for the first time in a wheelchair and not being able to function. Wow. I mean, so somewhat by necessity and you, you took that and you brought it into the world to help other people. And we had briefly spoken uh, via email about, of course, my fiance's mother who is uh, paralyzed from uh, C4, C5 down and also kind of uh, a little bit of a rare case where she has very little mobility and dexterity in her fingers as well. Um, so uh, the issue is one of the big reasons I want to get you on here is because it's slightly, you know, it's close to my heart like it is extremely close to your heart and it limits uh, her name is Monica, it limits her travel uh, quite significantly. So when you work with a client, what services do you go and what services do you provide for that, that uh, wheelbarrow, excuse me, a wheelchair traveler and other people who have uh, potential handicap or accessibility issues? Well, I work with clients who are building or remodeling. So I'll work okay. with the owner, I'll work with the architect, I work with the interior designer. So I'm a part, I'm embedded in that design team, looking at the accessibility and the inclusion uh, for people of all types of disabilities, not just people in wheelchairs, but people who have a vision impairment or are blind or are deaf or have an intellectual disability. Let's look at the whole spectrum of people with disabilities. Of course, I have the lived experience since 98 being in a wheelchair, um, and that is where a lot of this accessibility comes to play. So I like to be a consultant to look at the plans with them to see on paper what they may have overlooked so that they can redesign the lines on paper and make this home much more accessible, much more inclusive, much more marketable for them for the long term. 
Okay, and and how does Universal Design? You mentioned it's a wide wide variety of, of 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 people. How does Universal Design help with a variety of handicaps? Uh, speaking towards you know the a lot of travelers a lot of uh, people traveling in short-term rentals are 65 and older these days and that comes with some uh you know a little bit of lack of mobility and other issues like knee surgeries or, or hip replacements when i go and speak to when i i just recently learned a bit about universal design so this is a learning experience for me and when i had gone and, and spoken to some people they immediately think of kind of just one category of of traveler the traveler in in a wheelchair but that segment of 65 and plus is is completely overlooked so how does universal design help those folks with varieties of the handicaps yeah there's a surprising number with mobility impairments they don't use a wheelchair they don't use a walker they don't use a scooter but ask them to climb 12 steps and then they're going to go no i can't do steps very well or i need a handrail on both sides in order to stabilize me um, they may have had a knee replacement or a hip replacement. They may have had some arthritis um, in their hands or their hips or their, any of their joints. And so they say, well, I can't open the door because it's a round doorknob. My hands have arthritis, so I can't even get into the home. Or I can't get into the shower. I can't get whatever. Uh, so we look at all the limitations um, as we age or if we're born with these limitations and make those homes much more um, compliant and making life a lot easier for all of the travelers that come there. I, watching some of the information you had sent over in, in some of the previous podcasts and videos that you had created, specifically one related to VRBOs, you had pointed out some things that uh, completely go over my head when I look at homes and look at short-term rentals, and that's some, some very simple things like the height of the toilet, the height of the bed, Etc. And when you speak about people with some of those mobility issues, making or breaking a guest experience, creating a wonderful guest experience for them, as simple as potentially is there comfort and ease in getting in and out of bed? Is there comfort and ease of, of using the, 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 the restroom? And so the information you had sent me really made me start looking at these homes through a completely different lens. So what information is in your book, The Universal Design Toolkit, and how can listeners get a copy of that from you? Would you mind going into a little bit of specifics of what's in there? Yes, I wrote the book, and my husband, Mark, later illustrated it and designed it. We have color pictures of our home, the Universal Design Living Laboratory, and you can actually get a free copy of the book on our website, which is simply the initials udll.com. We actually have a virtual tour of our home, and the free chapter is a list of all the universal design features in our home, room by room. The Universal Design Toolkit is a great guide. It's for people who are wanting to remodel or build, who own the property, as well as an interior designer or a builder or a contractor. So it's both for the consumer and the professional. And it goes through what we experienced building our national demonstration home. The book is available printed. If you go to Amazon, they'll send you the printed copy. It is about two, over 200 pages, um, again, with full color <coughs> photographs um, showing the dimensions, showing the illustrations, giving you the details about the sink height and the knee space and the countertops and in all kinds of resources for people who need help and funding. Uh, the book is available electronically. A lot of people like to read it on their phones or tablets or their desktop, and they like to have it with them wherever they go rather than bringing a paper copy. So they'll buy the electronic PDF version, and that's at universaldesigntoolkit.com. And with that purchase, with the PDF, you also get access to 16 videos, which are wonderful um, educational programs and tours of our home. So they get a bigger package. That's absolutely wonderful. Can you briefly touch on, is universal design and ADA, are those the same things? Are those different things? Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, the Americans with Disabilities Act, of course, is part of the United States Department of Justice. And it's a historical piece of legislation 
that was signed in 1990. That is not going to come into play for short-term vacation rental single-family homes. That is only for the condominiums, the apartments, and the public spaces, as well as uh, commercial buildings, banks, restaurants. So um, the ADA doesn't apply when you're looking at single-family. And when you're looking at the ADA, think of it as the floor, the baseline of accessibility. And that's where universal design starts. You have to know the baseline of accessibility in order to build upon it. And that's where universal design is. It is building upon the basics of accessibility going beyond. And let me give you an example. In our front Please. entrance, the front door, we didn't want any steps. We wanted just a gradual slope, a gradual pitch to the concrete that leads from the parking area in our portico to the front door. Now the ADA might recommend a one in 12 slope, which means you need 12 feet of space for every one foot of height. And that creates a nice gentle slope. But we wanted something less steep. So we went to a one in 20. And that's the universal design standard. So that when I come out of that front door, I'm not going as fast in my wheelchair. And when people are coming up to the front door, they don't need as much muscle power to get in. So if that can help you, the ADA, of course, is uh, easy to find on the ADA.gov website to know what their standards are for their commercial spaces. But there are no sets of universal design standards with the government. However, there's tons of checklists in my book that are referenced. They're all over the world. Every different organization um, and individual has created helpful checklists for universal design. And I think I've created quite a few of them, including the one that is the free chapter with a list of universal design features in our home, room by room. Okay, then this is important, that distinction you just made is important because a lot of the folks we work with in the short-term rental industry, uh, they're not building the home from the ground up. So a lot of these folks will be retroactively um, bringing universal design to their short-term rentals. And when I first started speaking to some uh, current homeowners about making some of these changes, um, just over the last week of from being uh, introduced to you from Justin Ford from Breezeway, immediately some of them jumped to, well, you know, we don't want to spend the time or the money or the effort to make something ADA compliant. And I was like, well, hey, you know, let's, let's backtrack a little bit here. That's really more for the commercial space, et cetera. This is a way that we can appeal to a significantly larger demographic of travelers who are facing challenges of, of getting away from their own home or, or from getting out of their own city. And we have this plethora of homes, you know, we manage about 200 homes here in the area. And if just two or so owners would be uh, open to maybe at the, uh, with the help of Hosty and through your material, retroactively making those home universally designed, it returns us to one of our very core missions of hosting, and that's creating an amazing guest experience and having people live like a local and sharing what we love about Colorado Springs. So would you mind going over some examples of, of some easy ways to, to retroactively fit a residential home being used for short-term rentals to be more accessible to every, every traveler? Well, here's my advice. Low cost, high impact. How about that? They love to hear that. Low cost, <laughs> high impact. Let's Absolutely. look at can they get into the house? Is there Absolutely. at least one entrance that has no steps? If indeed there isn't any entrance with no steps, you're going to have to look at ramping that. And as I mentioned to you, the 1 in 12 would be your ADA standard. But if you could go 1 in 20, that would be better. Again, to review, for every foot, of elevation, you're going to need 12 feet of ramps in order to cover that. So it can be done with portable ramps that you buy the aluminum ramps and have them available, or you can make wooden ramps, or you can have a concrete um, structure to get into the house. Now, is the doorway wide enough? You're going to need at least 32 inches of clear space. So open the door all the way and get your tape measure and see, is there 32 inches with that door open? 
that's the minimum. I'd like to recommend a 36 inch door. So if you wanted to do a very low cost solution and not tear out all the doors to remodel that house, there's a real simple item at the hardware store, about 50 bucks, and they're called swing away hinges. And you replace the hinges on your current door with these swing away hinges and you could get up to five more inches of clearance where when you open that door, it swings away if you've got the clearance there to give more access. So very simple. If you don't need a ramping solution, but you've just got a higher threshold, I want something about a half inch, that threshold to get in. If it's an inch or two inches, you're gonna need to buy another item at the hardware store or go online and look for rubber door thresholds. They're very inexpensive. You just slip that thing on there. There's no installation. You just put this rubber door threshold on the existing threshold and it levels that out okay. so that people can get into the door. Taking a look at your doorknobs, if they are the old style round knobs, as I mentioned, people with paralysis are gonna have some difficulty opening that door. So getting um, a new set of door handles would be another very inexpensive way. So all I've looked at so far is getting into your home. Those are simple ones making sure that door isn't too heavy to open, um, that you know it, it's appropriate, it's not uh, swollen and sticking. So that, that was one of the number one reasons in a market study that Open Door did in 2020, asking visitors with disabilities, what were some of the problems you've experienced? And that was one of them. The doors were hard to open and too heavy. Um, so they were looking at that, they're also looking at not being able to have a, um, a bedroom on the first floor with an elevator if it had to go to the second floor. And may they I, weren't finding may I ask shower you? chairs or benches. Um, and those are very inexpensive to put into a, a freestanding shower to have some way to transfer to a bench, either a portable or one that's built in. Okay, may, may I ask, when we look at homes with multiple floors, would it be a wise idea to take a home if, if the bathroom, kitchen, at least one bedroom is on the main floor, the accessibility, is it wise to take a home like that and convert it to universal design? Or from your experience, would that potentially create a problem because the home is not accessible fully to a traveler in a wheelchair? Is it okay to take two-story homes and do this? Would you not recommend it? Just in, any kind of off-the-cuff thoughts There's on that? There's a lot of ways. It's just a matter of what the um, investment is and what the rental potential is. Um, putting in an elevator could be a budget buster. Um, they're not that inexpensive or the house might be too small and it just doesn't accommodate an elevator. And I'm not talking about a little elevator. Yeah. There are elevators that people can stand up in and use, but those are too small for a wheelchair person in, in terms of a person using a wheelchair. So you've got to have a wide enough cab, a deep enough cab, wide doors in order to get in. So the elevator may not be the economical way. It might be better to have that first floor um, totally available from bedroom and bathroom and kitchen. And then the staircases for people who can use stairs. There are also stair lifts available that are less investment than an elevator, but the staircase has to be wide enough. And uh, depending on the configuration, if it's a, a round staircase or has a lot of curves in it, it gets a little more costly to put in a stair lift in that staircase. Yes. The other problem is if someone's in a wheelchair, they transfer onto the seat to get upstairs, their wheelchair is on the first <laughs> floor. So that means they have to have two wheelchairs or they have to have someone bring the wheelchair up to the second floor. So Very good that's point. not convenient. Very good point. A lot of what you're discussing is, is width and height, you know, making sure uh, pathways, walkways, doorways are wide enough and also height. Can you speak to the importance of accessibility? You know, I, I believe you'd mentioned you sit somewhere around 4'10 in your chair, is that correct? I'm 4'2 in, in my chair, chair as I see. 
on seated person. Okay. Um, I'm five one when I do stand, but I can't stand unassisted. I have to hold on to a counter. And and this affects things like for stoves that have the the dials on the on the back side having to reach over potentially hot spots of, and and reaching for dishware glasses there was a very uh very cool fix for dishware in your video uh track guests of all abilities where the uh the guests could reach up and you're able to pull down the the cabinet could you speak to that a little bit and the importance of of height in in designing a short-term rental through universal design yeah how how high can a person who's seated reach what's that what's that going to be and if I'm seated right now at 4-2, um, basically what we're looking at is the sweet spot of what things need to be on shelves that I can get to. And I want that upper limit around 48 inches or four feet. That's where I can reach things. I can get to the dishware, the glassware, pots and pans, or linens, bed or bath linens. So that's where shelves, the upper limit can be. The lower limit is 18 inches, otherwise it could be a problem that it's just too low from a seated position and I'd be unbalanced and fall out. Now there are um, articulated hardware that you can install yourself in shelving that you just grab it and pull it down and those shelves come to your level and we've got I think four of those in our home for some of the upper shelves. Okay. And countertops, breakfast buffets. Um, items of those natures, what would be some of your recommendation for someone who's you know, maybe the the countertop space is, is a little bit higher than, than that 48 eight inches or so. Um, would you recommend someone potentially remodeling cabinets or do you have maybe a, a little bit of a more affordable uh, retroactive fix for someone who wants to go down this road and maybe not have to remodel the whole kitchen? Yeah, if they're going to remodel, I'd like to consider some 30-inch high cabinets okay. or countertops and 34-inch. Those are the, the range, 30 to 34. I have a 34-inch counter around my sink and cooktop and, and uh, the majority of the space. My husband's 6'4". Yes. I'm 4'2". <laughs> and 34 is a great height for both of us. So uh, letting that, that dimension resonate with those who are watching or listening today is that 34 inch countertop is wonderful for people of all heights and abilities now when i'm cooking and preparing meals i'll go to the 30 inch section on my center island in my prior house i actually had a little desk in the kitchen and lucky for me that desk was at 30 inches and i could just roll in my wheelchair to that desk for meal preparation so thinking in terms of maybe putting a desk in if you're not gonna remodel the whole kitchen, and that way you've got knee space and wide enough clearance for someone to sit at that desk as a meal preparation area. Um, I also wanna talk about microwave placement. Please. Many times they're above the cooktop. Yes. Um, that's not gonna work. So if they're already installed in the kitchen above the cooktop somewhere, just have a second one somewhere on the counter so that someone can have access to a lower level microwave um, who can't stand up and get the one that's above the cooktop. Yeah, that may even be above the cooktop, you know, all the way to the back. You brought up something extremely important that I really want the audience to get from this. This is universal design. So you're not, you're not taking your home and you're not... Um, you're not making it ADA compliant. You're not making it for only tr uh, wheelchair travelers. You're not making it only available to handicapped people. This is accessible. This is universal. Like your husband, very tall gentleman, uh, you are in your chair around 4'2". You both still are able to function in your home and enjoy a high quality of life. So this isn't pigeonholing a short-term rental into one demographic of travelers. It's actually expanding the group of travelers that you could host in your home. Do you have a little bit of information about, you know, the 65 and plus kind of that travel group um, that you're seeing? What percentage of the United States, you know, are, are, have a disability? Because these folks are traveling. These folks are spending money. They're enjoying life. 
Yeah, I'm going to refer to some data that I've got up on my screen. So That'd be wonderful. Um, one of them is there was a study released in 2020, people with disabilities in the United States, and there are 13% of the U.S. population. So if you want to increase your revenue by 13%, looking at this population, they're looking for places to vacation. Um, I also looked at the Open Door organization, their 2020 marketing study, and they were looking at um, people traveling, just people with disabilities, a profile of travelers with disabilities. They're staying multiple nights and they're bringing other people with them. Um, and so we have um, the majority of travelers with disabilities are generally accompanied by someone um, 69% of the time, only 31% of the time are they coming by themselves. And on the last trip, most travelers with disabilities, 75% of them, were away from home three or more nights, typically four nights. Um, and, you know, they're spending money, of course. They are out there. There's a lot of travelers with disabilities. So don't overlook it. And these multiple generations, You've got grandma, grandpa, the, par the adult parents. Then you've got the, uh, sometimes the teenagers or the young children. And there might be a fourth generation that's coming. Absolutely. So we've got to accommodate them all so that they have life and dignity and respect rather than saying, oh, this house doesn't work for grandpa. He's going to have to go to the hotel down the street. And he can't stay here. Well, you bring up such wonderful, a big... Uh big point of conversation in the vacation rental industry right now is there was an incredible influx of, you know, 60 plus, uh, 65 plus travelers who were, could no longer travel in hotels because hotels got shut down so significantly during COVID. So we had this huge uptick of new travelers in the short term rental market, a lot of which are in that demographic that universal design uh, is beneficial for. And so one of the big topics of conversation in this market is how does a property manager or a owner who manages their own vacation rental capitalize on this new wave of travelers that are coming in and as hotels open back up how do we keep them and make them turn, convert them into re return short-term rental users so first-time short-term rental users being forced out of the hotel industry more than likely going to go back to the hotel industry because that's what they know. So it's our responsibility as host to capture on that and creating these homes so that the first time user in them wants to return and enjoys themselves. And I view this as a, a, a absolutely wonderful way to capitalize on that new group of travelers that are trying short-term rentals for the first time. The group of people who are trying vacation rentals for the first time are not the, you know, the 20, 25, 30, they've been using vacation rentals. It is this age demographic that can benefit from universal design the most that are trying vacation rentals for the first time. And like you said, if they bring grandpa or, or whomever it may be, and and it's a it's a family getaway. You've you've created separation in the family. You, you you you're not creating that amazing guest experience. So I'm kind of just thinking out loud here. But if, even if you have a two floor home and and you have a bedroom, a bathroom, kitchen on that first floor, you can still set up your first floor at, at least to the point where the the older folks or the family or the folks with the with a potential handicap can still come and participate in the family vacation. Um, I, and, and really no point to that, but uh, this is a phenomenal way to capitalize on that new, new wave of travelers that are coming into this market in that 65 and plus age group. Um, and I, I think if, if you can bring a new first time traveler out of a hotel where that's comfort and they know um, what they're going to get and you can create that same experience of comfort and high quality of life for them in a home. I see it as absolutely no brainer to do some of the things like change the, the, the entrance way, use the, the double sided hinges that allow guests coming out 
getting a second microwave. You know, they're forty, fifty dollars. These are such incremental changes that have such large improvement in the quality of someone's experience. For everybody. For as, everybody. As you said, it's not just those who have a disability. It's not just the uh, 65 plus. I mean, who wouldn't like to have more space? Who wouldn't like to have a wider door? Who wouldn't like to have more room in the facility with less furniture in the, in the path of travel? <laughs> You know, and in terms of the shower, I like the curbless uh, roll-in shower, walk-in shower. You know, who wouldn't want a bigger, nicer shower without a curb there and then a nice bench and a handheld shower that whoever wants to sit can sit and have that handheld shower. Whoever wants to stand can put the handheld shower at the top position and use it. And it's much more spacious and, um, and accommodating to everyone. As you've gone down this, this journey in your life, uh, creating the Universal Design Toolkit, what challenges have you faced? I, um, you know, bringing something like this to market, have, have you faced any challenges? Has it uh, been very received very warmly? Well, the builders are the, the ones who have to decide on, are we going to build homes with Universal Design features? And then the people who are shopping for homes need to figure out, is this the home that I need to buy? And um, there's not that many homes out there with these features in them from the beginning. So that's where the challenge lies, getting the building community to start looking at production homes from the aspect of universal design. That would be the first challenge to get over, is to let builders be very aware of this market and and go and be proactive rather than reactive and build homes with these features already there why should we have to remodel them later let's build them right from the beginning universal design is just plain good design yeah absolutely and and again i just i want to reiterate you know when when i was first introduced to your content from from justin ford my initial thoughts will, were, well, we can't pigeonhole it. We can't pigeonhole ourselves into one category of, of, of traveler. And as I learned more and more about it and, and what universal design was, it just became very evident to me that this opens the door more for, this opens the door to more travelers as opposed to closing the door to more travelers. So very excited. I'm, I'm very happy that I can help uh, spread the message and, and I've actually, I'm just going to put this in the uni out in the universe here. Uh, you know, I think it would be just absolutely phenomenal to be a part of building, you know, three to four universally designed homes that are built from start to finish specifically for vacation rentals here in, in Colorado Springs. So, so people, um, so folks in, in wheelchairs who are still traveling around the country can come enjoy, you know, my, my home city. That would be wonderful. So... Thank you very much uh, for, for joining me here today. Again, um, Rosemary Rossetti, uh, creator of the Universal Design and the author of the Universal Design Toolkit. Would you mind please just telling the audience one more time where you can they can find the Universal Design Toolkit and how they can learn more about you? Sure. The Universal Design Toolkit is available as an electronic PDF with 16 videos at universaldesigntoolkit.com. That's an easy one. Um, if they prefer or want to, in addition, the printed copy, just get it on Amazon and they'll send you the printed copy. My website, I have two. One of them is the Universal Design Living Laboratory and you just use the first initials, udll.com. And that's where you can take the virtual tour of our home, the video tour, there's over 100 articles, um, and you can see um, how all these contributors helped my husband and I. We couldn't have built this house without over 200 contributing companies. Wow. My second website is rosemariespeaks.com, R-O-S-E-M-A-R-I-E-S-P-E-A-K-S.com. And that is uh, the website that shows my consulting and my speaking, a lot of videos. Um, more description of my business. Well, thank you. Rosemary, thank you for joining us. Uh, 
Thank you for joining us for the Short Term Mental Intel Podcast number 28. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.